so welcome to Talking Absolute Worship um, and welcome to Easter 4. We will be looking at bits of Acts, Psalm 23, uh, bits of Revelation and bits of John chapter 10. Uh, and the first thing you'll notice is this is a head-to-head. -head. This is an experiment. It's just me and Rachel and any comparisons to Griff Reese jones and Mel Smith will not be appreciated. But this is a head-to-head -head with the two of us just talking absolute worship for Easter 4. Um, so Rachel, no surprises, you're going to go first because it's either you or me. So please kick off. Where are you going? <clears throat> well, part of me really wanted to... Um... To, to do something with Revelation um, because it doesn't come around all that often in the lectionary and I usually kind of go <laughs> and try to avoid it. Um, so I was kind of trying really hard but actually the thoughts that were coming to me were more around, around some of the other readings. Um, so unfortunately Revelation is put aside so somewhat. Um, but the sense that I got just from reading and reflecting on those readings was um, the, the, th the thought that came to mind was that sometimes you just don't know what to do. Uh, and I think in some ways that partly may, may be a reflection of where we are at the moment. Um, as we're recording this, we're about three to four weeks into the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and lots of us are just thinking, I don't know what to do. Um, I want to. I want to do something that's going to be helpful, but I don't know what to do. And I seem to spend a lot of time just kind of lost in thought, almost. But just thinking, uh, what, what, <laughs> what can I do? And then that's alongside all the other why questions. Why is this happening? So I, I really felt an affinity to the reading from Acts, uh, in which um, Tabitha has died and she's clearly a beloved member of her Christian community. Um, it, it says she came ill and died. I mean, that all sounds very sudden, but we don't know whether it was, whether they had any way to prepare for this or whether it really was, you know, as quick as that. Um, but just that sense of, well, what do we do now then? Uh, that follows any, any big bereavement really um what do we do now and they they realize that peter's not that far away and so they um say okay let's get here peter's gonna help us um and i wonder if they really got what they expected actually um because they might just have been thinking well you, we just need peter to lean on we just need his presence you know he is the rock after all um we just need his presence with us that's going to help and then actually it turns out in a way you know they get they get Tabitha back um they may that may not have been on their minds at all <laughs> when they sent the message um so I felt that there was quite a lot of um kind of chaos going on in that reading from Acts there's a bewildered community um lots of stuff you know they're showing Peter all the things that Tabitha has made and trying to sort of tell him, tell him all about her. Um, so there's quite a lot going on. And then I felt that it's a bit of a contrast with the John reading, um, which seems to me to come in two parts, really. You've got the busy part where um, the religious leaders are sort of demanding um, to know, you know, come on, tell us, give us, give us a straight answer here. And Jesus is saying, well, I've, I've already given you a straight answer and you, you, you're not believing me or listening to me anyway but you've got that and then I felt that there was just a sort of kind of calmness about the second part of reading where Jesus then talks about um you know you, you don't you don't understand because you don't belong to my sheep but um and that sense of you know I know my sheep they hear my voice um they follow me and I just felt like I can imagine Jesus talking in a really calming, you know, let's kind of just tone, let's let's bring things down kind of voice. Mm. Um, and just a sense of maybe peace around that. Um, he knows his sheep and he's not gonna let go of them. Uh, and so for me today, I, I just feel that in the midst of all this, not knowing what to do and thinking about 
people dealing with all sorts of um, loss um, for, for whatever reason at the moment, there's just a lot of loss in the air, it seems. Mm. Um, and we kind of stumble around calling out to Jesus in quite a degree of bewilderment and confusion um, and relying on Jesus to hold us really and to bring us through. And I think if I were to dip into Revelation, I would say uh, we don't come through unscathed mm. <laughs> because these things change us. And we've got in Revelation the the um, the worshippers have come through this great ordeal, um, whatever that quite means. Um, and they but they but they they gather and they worship the lamb is still their shepherd. Um, and so I just felt, I felt very calm. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's something that we, that we could all hold on to um, at the moment. Um, the other thing that, that I, I came to discover, which I don't know if I could do anything with it, is that we're preparing for the 8th of May, Easter 4. And on the 8th of May in 1373, Julian of Norwich had her visions, mm -hmm. um, which led her to um the sense of uh jesus wanting us to turn to him and you know that love is kind of the answer to <laughs> give a very um simplified <laughs> version of all of her stuff so i don't know if there might be something around julian of norwich that can be drawn on to but i think i'm just going with we don't know what to do um and jesus doesn't tell us what to do either in you know not in very specific um detailed ways but we're held, we're held by, by Jesus. Um, that was, yeah, I think that was where I was going to go. Mm. And, and I wonder too, if there's, um, there's kind of an element of surprise as, as you were talking then and, and thinking, you know, that we don't know what to do. Um, you know, the people call out for, for, for Peter and they're expecting one thing and they get another because it does feel like a funeral visit, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, showing him all the things it's, it's not a, Come, come immediately because you can do something yeah. uh, or bring her back to life. That's not what they're expecting. It's because we want to share our grief with you. Mm. And, and Peter turns that on the head. Um, and I'm kind of wondering whether in Revelation too, I mean, yeah, I run a mile from things like washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Right. But again, maybe it's just meant to say, um, be ready to be surprised. It's not, it's not ordinary. It's not what you expect. If you wash something in the blood of a lamb, it really isn't going to be cleaner. Um, so yeah. there's something against our expectations going on. Yeah. Um, and I do love that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Because yeah. it kind of isn't even a, you know, God will, God will make it that there's nothing to cry about. There's an acknowledgement of the pain. But yeah. but then you know God Himself you know I, I yeah, yeah. So, so there is something that draws me to the Revelation reading even while there's something yeah. that, that that sends me back um, and the similarities and then, with the Psalm as well in Revelation I think about um, you know hungering no more and thirsting no more mm -hmm. um, you know it just felt like um, and with a whole lamb shepherd idea uh, I just felt that actually it picked up on Psalm 23 which is the psalm for the day again <laughs> yeah yeah it does seem to come around a lot but it's a good one. Uh, but yeah, yeah. And, and is I mean even there I don't know is there a surprise it's hard to be surprised by Psalm 23 but mm. but I, I, I think it might even been on a previous talking absolute worship that that somebody said yeah, the, you've spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me, in the presence of my enemies, whatever mm -hmm. translation, that, that that can feel like gloating, you know, so you're sat at the table with God and you can to your enemies, or is it an invitation to sit down with your enemies? The table is spread and, and it's open for those who were enemies to come, so it's a place of mediation, if you like. So again, yeah. is it a surprise? do we want in the psalm god to say yes i'm on your side and i'm not on their side um i know there's been with the ukraine stuff there's been quite a lot of people saying should we be praying for russia and you think well yes what yes. sort of god do you believe in if you're only yeah. going to pray for the people of ukraine of course we pray for the people of ukraine but we also pray yeah. 
for the people of Russia. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some, something um, I, I, I quite I quite like any any Bible reading where there's something that captures you a, a little bit on the hop. Mm. Um, and and maybe some of that is is in what Jesus says about the sheep hearing my voice. You, know, you were saying about you know we cry out to Jesus um, in our distress and and wanting help and not knowing what to do. Um, and maybe this reminds us to listen um, yeah. and be calm enough to see well what what is Jesus saying back yeah. to us. Yeah. Um, so there's there's certainly there's, there's certainly plenty of richness to be mined. Mm. For mm. Easter fall, yeah, I had fun with the with the Acts nine and the story of Tabitha, um, and 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 this may be completely <laughs> completely spurious, uh, and I'm not a linguist, so I, I it was it was the name Tabitha. I think it's a great name, yeah. and interesting, which in Greek is Dorcas, which we all know from the reels of thread, yeah. Um, but the so what why why Tabitha if she's also Dorcas you know why not one or the other why have we got both now what, what's going on and then there was something about the Tabitha get up made my brain go ooh mm. and and go to Mark's telling of the story of the raising of Jairus's daughter um, and and you you just said she was a beloved member of the community. Jairus was the leader of the synagogue. So there's that kind of, you know, this isn't just a death, if anything is ever just a death. But this is the death of a beloved member mm. of the community. Um, and in in Mark's account, there's that bit where they say to Peter, please come to us without delay. And it, and in Mark, there's that terrible tension of, of Jairus's daughter is ill and Jesus is told to come and... Um, you know, come on, come on, come on. You can feel Jairus kind of, you know, and then he gets the message, well, she's died. He's distracted, diverted by the healing of the woman with the hemorrhage and then returns to, to Jairus's daughter and says, Talisa, cool, yeah, yeah. little girl, get up. And because I'm not a, language, a linguist, I did a bit of looking around and that's the Aramaic, Talisa, cool. And so I thought, well, so, so did... Did Peter say in Aramaic, Tabitha kum? Was there something in Peter's mind that he didn't just click into what did they want Peter to do, but he really was thinking, well, what did Jesus do? He heard the voice of Jesus, if you like. He heard yeah. Jesus saying, he, he was there at the time, he recollected that story. And he, was there something in his brain that just went, Tabitha, Talitha, um, or is that only me? Uh, so I, yeah. I think I, I quite I quite like to play with that as a Peter listening to Jesus, to the voice of Jesus, and yeah. then using that as the guide for what to do, which then surprises everybody by not being what they wanted. Um, I'm aware that that some people, um, and I'm, I'm kind of one of them really, would say, but but the mark. Jairus's daughter they haven't put the lectionary didn't make that connection they haven't put them together um, I think well sometimes you know we can go a little bit off piste so I, I think I would I would quite like if I if I use that act nine to to put it with the with the mark yeah um, story and just that that whole what would Jesus do you know yeah. it, it hangs around because sometimes it's what exactly what we need to ask yeah. Um, but you know, what would Jesus say? What do we want to say to Jesus? And and or what do we hear Jesus saying? And how does it shape what we do? Yeah. Kind of where where I went with that one. I too, I'm afraid, kind of skipped over Revelation. Though I wondered, um, you know, there's always something about the 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 worship of heaven and the worship of earth, and are there ways in which we can make our earthly worship more heavenly mm. um but uh, that's kind of as far as i got really yeah. but that's something that other people might want to explore as they're looking at, yeah. at this and and certainly there's something there about um suffering and coming through suffering and the and jesus the lamb who also suffers and is with us but then god the father who will wipe every tear from their eyes who kind of you know sets it all right in the end mm. um i didn't get much further than that because yeah revelation's quite hard unless you're going to maybe go into it week by week and, and really yeah. unpack it yeah. 
Um, and then then I had a, a lovely conversation just this last weekend with uh, with a sheep farmer, as you do, um, in a congregation I was visiting. Um, and, and he said, oh, I've got to go because I've got a ewe who's just struggling a bit um, and I've just just got to sort of check on her. And then he came back later. I, I didn't look to see how well he washed his hands. Um, but but I was struck by, um, you know, he said, oh, yes, it was it was like this, but its its feet weren't out far enough. And I've watched enough farming programmes to know, yeah, it's like diving into a pool. Yeah. The, the feet are. So, yeah, having its feet up by its chin. And so, so, you know, and he sort of mimed a bit of pushing and pulling in a way that, again, this was a man I was sharing lunch with. So I really didn't want to think about where his hands would be. Um, but, but, and I said to him, I, I see lambs and, and my heart leaps as high as the lambs do. I, I love to see lambs. In, and I spend all my time driving around, oh, lambs, oh, lambs. Oh, you know, I just love it. I said, but, you know, you've got all the worry. Do you feel as excited? And, and he, he lit up and he said, oh, I never tire. I never tire of seeing a lamb born. Mm. He said, and I just, I'm so upset when one dies. Yeah. And he told me this very sad story of, of two oh, beautiful twin lambs and they were in this this field and there were some logs in the corner and they must have jumped on it. One of the logs fell. And and he was clearly, and this is a man with, I don't know, dozens, hundreds, I think, of sheep. Yeah. Yeah. You think, but he really loves every lamb. And there was just something a bit of, you know, that the, because we use the language of good shepherd so much, maybe, maybe we mm. we need to get back to, you know, that the shepherd loves. I do love yeah. my sheep, as a, another yeah. farmer in Devon said to me once. You know, uh, yeah, they, they, they and the, the way that the, the sheep respond to the person and the love and the care. Um, mm. So I sort of wanted to, because of having that conversation, just yeah. wrap all of this John ten up in, in a sense of the love of yeah. Jesus and the yeah. care of Jesus for each one of us. The um, sheep need a shepherd. They're not known for their independence, mm. um, <laughs> and they're always, you know, you hear about them getting, I don't know, stuck in a ditch, or you know, you feel like they're they're in some ways pretty useless. Yes. <laughs> um, you know they need kind of ongoing supports and sometimes quite hands-on um yes. nurture well, exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah i think this may be a good way to go um go, going back to what you were saying about the um acts reading mm. the, the same thought um kind of occurred to me about the two stories mm. because i had a distinct memory because i it was only yesterday that i put these things together I, I remember it must have been decades ago there was a question in church about what Jesus said to the little girl mm -hmm. and I put my hand up and I answered and I said Tabitha cum and they said oh no no it's Talitha and I went oh okay and so you know and it must have traumatized me somewhat because you know that I was I was probably a teenager when this happened uh, and then yesterday when I was reading the two passages that just came that whole thing just came back to me and I thought you know what I wasn't that far wrong <laughs> absolutely <laughs> because I do yeah I do I do think the other thing that interested me about the names was that um I've got a little note in my bible that said Tabitha in Aramaic and Dorcas in Greek both mean gazelle and I read one kind of slightly irritating commentary that kept referring to her as gazelle all the way through, <laughs> which I found a little bit distracting. And then, then I was kind of, it took me almost into Song of Solomon with the whole, you know, there's a lot of gazelles mm. mentioned in that book, <laughs> which is a bit, of a, a bit of a tangent. But yeah, the fact that we've got both names given and both names mean the same thing. Mm. Um, I didn't have time to really wonder about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, th uh, now you've got me wondering even whether um, whether Peter actually said Talitha cum, and mm -hmm. and people misheard and thought he assumed he'd said Tabitha cum. Yeah. But but you know, again, linguists will say, oh no, no, it's Talitha and Tabitha, or you know, yeah, there may be yeah. complete differences which which the written word doesn't communicate to me. Um, but but I think yeah maybe it's not so fanciful yeah. to link to link those stories and if if a teenage Rachel had said to me 
um, it's it's um, Tabitha, I would have said, oh, you know, you're nearly there, you know, you just, yeah. and maybe her name was Tabitha, we don't know her name. No, that's very so, true. You know, yeah. Who knows? Um, but yeah, ooh, yes, I, I too, I'm sure many of us are scarred by putting your hand up and getting things wrong in church. And I, mm -hmm. I try very hard not, not to ever say that someone is, is, is wrong, or I try not to ask questions actually, which are, which are those sorts of questions. Yeah, but, yeah. There we are. Things have moved on, even in the very short time since you were a teenager. So there we go. Yes. <laughs> I mean. um, so anything else? I mean, and I love the idea, sorry, your, your idea of the Julian of Norwich um, kind of resonance as well. That That's a, another way in which you, you could shape worship in a way that was much more around Julian of Norwich and was a lot more quiet and reflective. And yeah, that's, that's yeah, really yeah nice invitation to anything else that you've you've got that you wanted to um the, the other bits of worship other bits of worship um I, I, i'm going to tell you a story about julian of norwich um because a number of years ago um i was selling some um theological books on amazon because i was having a bit of a bit of a cull um, and I'd got two copies of the um, of Julian of Norwich's Revelations of Divine Love. So I put one up for sale um, and I had a message that came to me through Amazon um, from um, a nun in Switzerland. Um, and because I wasn't set up for selling overseas, um, she was wondering if I could make it so that she could buy this book. Um, and I wasn't really it was only a paperback book and I, I was I, I, I replied to her I was a bit naughty because I, I then bypassed the whole official route and contacted her directly and I said I want you to have the book I don't want you to pay for it send me your address um, and I will send it to you so I so I did that now every year on religious holidays um, and on the feast of Julian of Norwich um, this lovely lovely nun writes me an email and um so so we always just are, are in sporadic contact and then just before the pandemic we'd been to Italy and we were on the journey home driving through Switzerland and we'd stopped for lunch at Lucerne and Graham said to me oh we wonder how far we are away from the um from the convent and I had to look and we it was literally going to take us half an hour out of our way so we just decided right <laughs> we're going to go and visit her so we turned up at this convent and in in sort of you know in, in very um very old GCSE French I um I dragged up enough to uh to ask for this lovely sister um and they they gave us um, some food and drink while we were waiting for her to come through and she was so excited she literally ran out to meet oh. us um and then she said oh, I must go and get my friends because my friend I've told my friend all about you I must go and get my friend to meet you too so this other lovely and they were both really giddy they yeah. were so excited to see us um and then she she brought out some books about Julian of Norwich and she wanted me to have some of her books um and it was just lovely so every time I hear anything about Julian of Norwich I think about this lovely um person who's become a a, a, a friend mm. um and so yeah, so that's a bit of a tangent, <laughs> but I do think there's so much about Julian of Norwich that could easily shape worship. I mean, the whole idea, you could do a whole reflection on this idea about, you know, the um, the hazelnut mm. uh, and like everything being contained within it um, and all of kind of God's love being somehow poured into that. And we're like the hazelnut and, you know, all things will be well. I think that's another, um, mm -hmm. Another one of her things that doesn't mean everything's going to be okay, hmm. but it means that we're going to come through, kind of stuff. Um, so I think there's, I think I'd do a lot with Julian of Norwich in the rest mm. of the service. Mm. And and yeah. that all would be well. I mean, links really well with the the reading we've both been trying to avoid of Revelation, actually. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Absolutely. The, you know, and and the idea of of yes of of God holding holding in being. And that that sense, and I love your story. The 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 way that that love breaks through in simple ways, but also is this massive force that holds us all in being. I mm. I think yeah, that would be be wonderful to do in worship. Yeah. 
I've got a, a cautionary tale <laughs> to, to spread. You know, different sort of story. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I, I had a look around to see, you know, what's out there on, on YouTube about um, Jesus. I was looking for something about the love of Jesus as the shepherd. Um, and, and there were lots of cartoons of stuff and it was all a bit kind of what you'd expect. And since my brain was already thinking, how do you surprise and how do you find God in the surprises? So, so this, this is a bit surprising. This, and it may of course go to a, an advert, which we will then rely on. Um, sorry, I'm struggling to do two things at once. I'm struggling even to do one thing at once. We will rely on Phil to cut out um, anything that appears that shouldn't appear of advert yeah. teeth whitening or whatever. Uh, there we go. That's I was it was onto the Zoom startup page. Share sound. You definitely want that. And there we go. So there is sound, but this is the point at which the priest has gone out, and we don't know what's going to happen next. So. Here's the surprise, um, and uh, if I press the button, it actually moves. There we go. Now I get the door from you. There we go. Thank you. So this is our new pet. This is Peanut. What do you think? Is Father Martel gonna like it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. As some of you may know, I couldn't get a dog, but I put on Facebook earlier that I wanted to get a sheep. And some people said, you know, normally, Father, people ask to borrow a cup of sugar, and you're asking to borrow a sheep. So um, I really wanted to get a sheep for my last Good Shepherd homily here because they're a beautiful um, image for us. Sheep are sometimes a little bit scared and a little bit timid and a little bit afraid. But this, I just met the sheep, by the way, too, right before Mass. And... Uh, <laughs> The, the good thing is, you know, shepherds have a way of getting to know their sheep. They do. So even this sheep, Peanut, who I just met before Mass, already you can see we're going to get along, right? <laughs> <laughs> what I love about it, too, is um, the image of the good shepherd, the, the sheep is often held like this. The good shepherd is holding the sheep. And what is so cool about it, like right now, I can feel the warm breath of this sheep on my head, <laughs> right? I can feel this. It's really, really soft. There's like a pillow on me right now. I can feel um, the softness of the sheep. The other thing is if I go like this and listen real close, I can even hear the heartbeat of the sheep. And it's really an amazing thing how close a shepherd is to his sheep. And that's why I think Jesus gives us this image of the good shepherd is so that we can realize how close he is to us. Now, boys and girls, you're going to be receiving your first communion. And at that point, it goes off a bit because he's, boys and girls, you're going to receive communion mm -hmm. and closeness with Jesus was kind of his theme. But I just thought, first of all, kudos for having a live <laughs> sheep in a service. But, but I didn't know which way he was going with all that. Um, and uh, I did think behind every good priest, there's a woman waiting to catch the sheep if the sheep makes a break. <laughs> There's a little bit of that. But that bit where he says, I can hear the heartbeat, um, touched me. Yeah. Really, it really did. And, and there was something there about, about the, the love of Jesus. And I think, I think I'd always thought of the shepherd as a caring metaphor, but I'd never quite got the kind of the loving bit mm. before. So yeah. um, I'm, I'm not, I am not going to take a live sheep into worship ever, anytime, ever. Yeah. I was going to say anytime soon, but I don't. I don't think I would dare to, especially in a, in a white uh, cassock. Yeah, I did um, think that was great. <laughs> no, babe, no, babe. Um, but yeah, but but um, it, it's it's lovely to 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 see that and hear that and to really explore the Jesus as Good Shepherd in that way. And I I just thought that was so brave. Um, mm. The fact that it was being filmed, I'm deeply appreciative. Yeah. So we could. We could all share it. So, so that that was my bit, really. Um, mm -hmm. Whether I might show that in worship, um, or you know, depending on where I am, and I haven't looked up actually to see where I am. Um, some of the congregations I visit, there are shepherds and who do have sheep, and and 
it would be lovely actually just as my conversation last weekend to get one of the actual shepherds to say how they feel about their sheep um mm. and and to to hear something of the the love and care and uh, mm. that's probably what i would what i would aim to do to unpack that bit yeah um, so i yeah, i was sorry i was just thinking while while um i was watching the um the video as well way um Actually, it might be nice to do something with some kind of wool in the prayers. Um, I've had a big kind of, um, well, not massive, but I've had a kind of loom um, that I've used before. And there's been, you know, lots of bits of wool and I've invited people to kind of weave their prayer mm. into, the, into the overall thing. And I think you can get, um, you can fairly easily get hold of, um, you know, proper wool that's, not yet been spun but it's kind of treated enough that you can probably do it yourself with your fingers into mm. something and i think maybe there's maybe something to do with that would be a nice thing mm. to do mm. I, I think anything anything that helps people feel they've, they've done something in prayer and they've left something behind i think that's that's why lighting a candle is so powerful yeah because when you've gone away the, the candle's still there. The idea that your your prayer isn't lost somehow. It's not just a moment and then it's mm. gone. That your your prayer is is there almost. Maybe that that God's holding your prayer like like the shepherd's holding the sheep. You know, and is is um, as attentive to to our heartbeat in prayer. Mm. Yeah, it would be nice to do yeah. to do something for people to to feel there's a there's a solid symbol of their prayer mm. which which carries on. I think prayer trees ribbons on railings all sorts of things that i think show we all want to to do something so yeah. that it's not just words although yeah. there's nothing wrong with words but but something that symbolizes the, the yeah. prayer and, and helps other people to join in prayer i like yeah. the idea of weaving them together mm -hmm. lovely well um, for our first head to head i think that's that's gone pretty well so we want to bless everyone who's listened to this uh, as you prepare for worship and hopefully you too can be part of this conversation and take some of these ideas and your own ideas and much more importantly to the congregations you serve so Rachel is going to pray for all of us let's pray loving God sometimes we sit down to prepare to lead worship on a Sunday and we think we don't know what to do and I pray that um for all those who are going to be leading worship on the 8th of May, I pray that you would speak through the Bible passages and perhaps through some of the things that we've talked about today. Pray that you would enable people who lead others in worship to help people to draw near to you and to gain a sense of peace and surprise and love through all that we say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.